A quick digression. If the cities were so bad, why did people move there? Why this constant drain of people from the countryside into the living hell of the urban slums? Well, I've come south to Dorset, to the charming village of Tollpuddle, and it seems on the surface a picture of rural bliss. Why would anyone leave a place like this to live and work in the new industrial towns? Well, the fact is, life in the countryside in the early decades of the 19th century wasn't the rural bliss we imagine. Why come to Dorset? Well, this was the home of six laborers whose story, I think, illustrates the suffering experienced by many people on the land in the early decades of the 19th century. Their names were George and James Lovelace, James Hammett, James Brine, Thomas Stanfield, and his son, John. And they were each of them working as laborers, earning a weekly wage on the land of the major landowners, men like James Frampton, who owned a beautiful property, Morton House, a few miles outside Tollpuddle. Now, these men, Lovelace and the rest, they worked for Frampton as laborers because they had no land of their own. The late 18th, early 19th centuries saw the end of a process by which the land in England was carved up by act of parliament between the larger farmers and the major landowners. Villagers who'd grown veg on a little plot of land but couldn't prove ownership of that land they tended to lose out. Land that had once been held in common, land where you might graze a pig or a cow or forage for wood in the winter, were now enclosed. They were owned by someone else. And if you wanted to put food in your belly, you had to work for that someone, and he dictated how much you got paid. The going rate was nine shillings a week. For that, you could buy enough bread to feed your family. Nothing left over to pay the rent, let alone potatoes, salt, butter, cheese, let alone candles, thread, wood, coal, soap. And then in 1833, they cut the rate from nine shillings to eight, then seven. We're talking starvation wages. How did the rural poor respond to these desperate conditions on the land. Some suffered in silence. Some moved to the cities to seek employment in the factories. Some fought back. In 1830, across East Anglia and the Southeast, masked men had set fire to hayricks. 600 rioters were arrested and imprisoned. Meanwhile, here in Tollpuddle, Lovelace and his friends tried a different approach. This seat marks the site of a sycamore tree where the so-called Tull Puddle Martyrs used to meet. And what they decided here was that the only solution to end their suffering was to stick together, to form a union. They figured if they all held firm and they agreed to push Frampton for a decent rate, 10 shillings a week, say, Frampton would have no choice but to agree or he'd have no one to work his lands. And so they went to Morton House and they presented their, as they thought, perfectly reasonable demands. But Frampton called their bluff. What Frampton realized was that the power was in his hands. There'd been a population explosion over the previous hundred years. The population was now well back up to pre-Black Death levels. Plenty of hungry people needing work. Frampton could cut the rate to six shillings a week if he chose, and he did, and people still came forward to work his lands. And as for these six troublemakers, he had them arrested. Here, in the courtroom at Dorchester, Lovelace and the others were tried and sentenced. There was no law yet against forming a union, so they were tried using old laws designed to stop mutiny at sea. Their crime, such as it was, was that they had each made an oath 
promising never to reveal the contents of their meetings. To the powers that be, secret oaths smacked of revolution, and so the Tolpadal martyrs were sentenced to transportation. They were taken by prison ship to the other side of the world, to Australia, to work on the chain gangs. George Lovelace said in his defense, we have injured no man's reputation, character, person, or property. We were uniting together to preserve ourselves, our wives, and our children from utter degradation and starvation. It seems that here in the countryside, just as much as in the cities, society in these decades was somehow out of joint. We'd experienced such massive changes in our lives, urbanization, mechanization, enclosures on the land, but we'd not yet understood how to make those changes work for all of us. Some, many, were falling by the wayside. It was time now to start addressing the challenges of this brave new world. 